Plant roots provide a variety of functions. They anchor the plant and serve as the primary organs for absorbing water and nutrients from the soil. They can also store food, perform aeration, photosynthesis, and reproduction. We can talk about these amazing plant organs all day and will never run out of information, thus it's really a challenge to create this 10-minute lecture video. Roots develop from the embryonic radical in seeds. Dicots or plants having two cotyledons usually develop the top root system where a single primary root gives rise to the smaller secondary roots. In monocots, the primary roots die off and is replaced by the formation of adventitious roots originating from the stem. This led to the formation of a fibrous root system. Adventitious roots can also grow from leaves or other plant parts and dicots can also produce them. Let's have a longitudinal section of a dicot root to identify three prominent zones that result from the continuous addition of cells from the meristematic tissues at the tips. In the region of cell division, we can find the meristematic region giving rise to the primary meristems, the protoderm which will give rise to the primary epidermis, the ground meristem which will become the parenchymatous cortex and pith in some roots, the procambium, which is a solid cylinder at the center, will give rise to the primary xylem and the primary phloem. The tips are protected by the root cap, a mass of parenchyma cells that produce a lubricating material called mucilage that facilitates the movement of the root tip through the soil. It responds to gravity and it also recruits beneficial bacteria, especially the nitrogen fixers. It is important to learn that root movement in soils involve mostly the root apical meristem and the root cap, while the rest of the roots remain mostly stationary. The region of elongation is where cells start to increase their length several times. Here, the tiny vacuoles of cells join to form a larger central vacuole. The region of maturation is where cells start to differentiate into distinctive cell types and the epidermal cells start to grow root hairs. Root hairs are extensions of their cell membranes. These structures increases the surface area for absorption. A thin cuticle may also be present to protect the roots from pathogens. From here, I will switch to the cross-section so we can look at the generalized parts. The cortex is placed between the epidermis and the vascular tissues and is filled mostly with storage parenchyma cells. If we proceed towards its inner boundary, a prominent ring of cells called the endodermis can stand out when stained. The primary walls of endodermal cells are impregnated with suberin. And if you can recall, it is a waterproof substance. These bands of waterproof material form what they call as the Kasparian strip. This layer prevents water from passing easily through the cell walls into the central conducting tissues. If you remove this barrier, water along with other toxic substances and pathogens can rush to the central vascular tissues where they can be transported to the remaining areas of the plant body. With the endodermis preventing this, water and dissolved nutrients must cross the cells via the cell membranes where there is more regulation, making the endodermis a sort of a, a filter against the harmful substances that may enter the plant. The endodermis is greatly observed in most roots than in stems, thus its role in these organs are quite uh, obligatory. After the endodermis, we now have the vascular cylinder which is mostly filled with vascular tissues, the xylem and the phloem. There is however a layer of parenchyma cells immediately after the endodermis which can be one to several cell layers thick. This is called the pericycle and its cells can divide to form lateral roots or otherwise known as branch roots. They are like uh, smaller roots originating from a larger root. But don't mistake them for root hairs, which are again just extensions of the cell membranes and not really made up of individual cells. The pericycle also contributes to the development of the vascular cambium. Recall that it is a meristematic region that allows secondary growth. In woody plants, a second cambium, the core cambium, also arises in the pericycle outside of the vascular cambium and gives rise to cork tissue periderm. In short, the pericycle, aside from initiating lateral roots, also give rise to uh, lateral meristems with the assistance of some parenchyma cells associated with the vascular cylinder. The xylem tissues occur as a solid central core with the prominent arms extending towards the pericycle in young roots. You should expect that if lateral roots should develop from the pericycle, it must be in the direction of the xylem arms to not break the continuity of the conduction system. The lateral roots after piercing through the cortex and the epidermis to the soil must be able to bring water back. Thus, it must be near the xylem arms. I mentioned a while ago that parenchyma cells can still be found filling spaces in the vascular cylinder and they can form the pith, a centralized aggregate of parenchyma cells in some roots. They also contribute to the formation of the vascular cambium together with parenchyma cells in the pericycle as we have learned a while ago. Xylem generally conducts water towards the leaves while phloem brings solutes from the leaves to nourish the roots. 
It's a simple give and take between the roots and the leaves, with the stem and mediating in between. Let's now have a quick look at specialized roots with secondary functions aside from anchorage and absorption. The most common are of course storage roots. This sweet potato for example stores large quantities of starch and other carbohydrates which may later be used for extensive growth. Some are modified to store water especially in regions where water is scarce or there is less rainfall. Roots that form buds that can grow into new aerial stems called suckers are called propagative roots. These individual suckers can be separated from the parent plant and grown independently. Pneumatophores are common in mangrove trees and look like spongy outgrowths that allow gas exchange in the roots of plants that grow in wet areas with little dissolved oxygen. This usually extend above the surface of the water as if to siphon air from the environment. Aerial roots are common in orchids and known as villamen roots. It increases the ability of plants to hold water or maintain constant moisture. The epidermis of these roots are more than a single layer thick and like that of ordinary plants. In the corn, prop roots support the stems from wind and other physical disturbance. This uh, banyan tree produces aerial roots originating from the uh, branches and dangles reaching the soil. This can then initiate secondary growth and uh, create structures that look like secondary trunks. The vanilla plant also produces aerial roots that function in photosynthesis. Some herbaceous dicots and monocots have contractile roots that pull the plant deeper into the soil. Many lily bulbs are pulled a little deeper into the soil each year as new sets of contractile roots are developed. Some tropical trees growing in shallow soils produce huge buttress-like roots toward the base of the trunk, giving them great stability. Except for their angular appearance, these roots look like a part of the trunk. There are also roots that parasitize other plants using modified surface projections called hosturia that develop from the stem. Plants harboring these structures, however, can still make their own food by photosynthesis. Thus, they are not really obligate parasites. Lastly, let us look at the prominent microbial associations of roots. More than three quarters of all seed plant species have various fungi associated with their roots. The association is mutualistic. That is, both the fungi and the root benefit from it, but are dependent upon the association for normal development. The fungus is able to absorb and concentrate phosphorus much better than it can be absorbed by the root hairs. It also forms thread-like strands that facilitate the absorption of water and nutrients. The plant in return provides sugars and amino acids to the fungi. Plants with mycorrhizae develop few root hairs compared to those growing without an associated fungus. Although almost 80% of our atmosphere consists of nitrogen gas, plants cannot convert the nitrogen gas to usable forms. A few species of bacteria, however, produce enzymes which uh, they can convert nitrogen into nitrates and other nitrogenous substances readily absorbed by roots. Members of the legium family, which includes peas, beans, and a few other plants, form associations with uh, certain soil bacteria that results in the production of numerous small swellings called root nodules that are clearly visible when such plants are uprooted. The nodules contain large numbers of nitrogen-fixing bacteria. The plants provide shelter and nutrients to these bacteria, and they give usable nitrogenous nutrients to the plants in return. That's all I can share about plant roots, and hopefully that was helpful. By the way, my channel is new and it needs your support by subscribing, sharing, and liking my videos. I'm not doing this for money, but I need motivation from you guys to continue creating more biology content in the future. Thank you very much for watching.